forces. That's what we're getting into now. A force is something that exerts on an object. You have to have an object to fill a force. A force can cause an object to move. Okay. There are two main types of forces. One of them is contact forces, which means the objects have to be physically touching. There has to be an actual physical contact for those forces to exist. A push, a pull. So I can push on my calculator. That would be a contact force. The table is pushing up on my calculator. That would be a contact force. Um, if I could tie a string to my calculator, that would be a contact force. I have a little scale here. I can take a scale and pull up on this mass. That's a contact <coughs> force. So pushes, pulls, anything that physically involves contact is a contact force. Friction. As this calculator slides along the table, friction is causing a force as well. Friction is due to the rubbing of the materials calculator sliding on the table. So there's many contact forces. Any sort of push or pull because of touching is a contact force. Friction is a contact force. A string or a rope tied to an object would cause a tension as you pulled on it. That would be a contact force because the rope would be actually physically pulling on it. A surfaces pushing up on an object would be a contact force. Most forces are contact forces because it involves an actual physical contact between the object producing the force and the object feeling the force. The other type of force is a field force. The field forces are action at a distance. Gravity, for example. Do I have to be physically with my feet on the ground for gravity to affect me? No. If I jumped off the table, well, even while I was in the air, the whole reason I would fall to the floor is because gravity is acting on me. So gravity is an example of a field force, something that can act without physically contacting the other objects. Can you think of other field forces? Magnetism. Magnets don't have to be physically touching, but they can repel or attract each other. Was there another one? Or was that, everyone said magnetism? Light. light would be a contact, because the light has to actually physically touch the object to exert a force. But that's a good point. Light can exert a force. Another one? <coughs> Electricity. Charges. That's the whole concept of an atom. In the nucleus of the atom, you have protons. Around the nucleus, you have electrons. They are attracting each other. It's an electric force. So that is a field force as well. We are primarily going to deal with gravity and then contact forces in here. Those are the primary forces we're going to deal with. Okay. Now, to represent the forces, we need some symbols. Your book calls the force of gravity your weight, which is what it is. Your true actual weight is determined by how hard the pull earth pulls on you. When you stand on a scale, the scale pushes up on you, and gravity pulls down on you. Those are the two forces acting on you. However hard the scale pushes up on you is how hard you push on the scale. Okay. So the force of the scale, if you're standing stationary on the scale, then these forces, the net force, must be zero. If you have a net force <laughs> acting on an object, that is going to cause the object to move. If the object doesn't end up moving, then the net force must be zero. Okay? So the force of the scale is equal to the force of gravity. The scale 
we know the scale reads our weight. So the force of gravity is your weight. Okay. You may feel different weights depending upon motion. For example, if you get in an elevator and the elevator starts accelerating downwards, you feel a little lighter for a split second. That would be called an apparent weight. So actual weight is the force of gravity, what the force of gravity applies on you. Apparent weight is what you feel, how much you feel like you weigh. If you've ever ridden a roller coaster, as you go up over the top, you feel lighter. As you come down through the valleys, you feel heavier. Those would be apparent weights. That's what you would be feeling. Now, your book uses a W to represent weight. But I don't want to use W because we're going to use W in a couple chapters from now to mean something else. And I don't want you getting confused by two W's meaning different things. So for the force of gravity, I'm going to use a capital F so that I know I'm talking about force. And then I'm going to use a subscript G to represent that it's the force due to gravity specifically. Some other examples. Your book for tension uses a T, capital T. But I don't want you to confuse that with time. So I'm going to use a capital F with a subscript of T. So capital F meaning force, the subscript of T meaning tension. <coughs> Friction, your book uses a lowercase f, which also we use later to mean something else as well. I'm going to use a capital F with a lowercase f as a subscript to mean the force of friction. Sensing a theme here? I use capital F's for all of my forces. I'm going to write different subscripts to represent what different types of forces they are. The force of a surface acting on an object is called a normal force. Your book uses a lowercase n to represent it. I'm going to use a capital F with a lowercase n to represent it. The reason it's called a normal force is because it's perpendicular to the surface. For those of you who have had vector calculus, you've talked about the normal vector. The normal vector is the one that always points perpendicular to the surface. So the normal force always points perpendicular to whatever surface your object is lying on. For pushes and pulls, we'll use F in whatever subscript we feel like using at the time. Okay, But we'll use F to represent that it's a force. Okay, a couple of laws that we need to understand before we can jump in and do problems. The first person to really delve in and describe motion was Galileo. Galileo did a lot of experiments to try to figure out and understand how acceleration works and how gravity works. Newton built on Galileo's discoveries and he came up with three laws of motion. Number one, the first law is called the law of inertia. Now inertia is a measure of how much an object resists a change in motion. For example, let's say I had a 15 pound bowling ball and a basketball. So the bowling ball is in one hand and the basketball is in the other hand. They're approximately the same size but definitely not the same weight and not the same mass. If I wanted to roll both of them along the floor, would it be equally easy to do? No. It'd take more effort on my part to roll the bowling ball than it would to roll the basketball. Inertia is a measure of how hard it is to make an object's motion change. So the bowling ball would have more inertia than the basketball would. So if I rolled it back, say one of you were standing back there to catch it, would they be equally easy to stop? No. It would require more effort to stop the bowling ball than it would the basketball. Again, because it has more inertia. So inertia basically is related to the mass, the mass of the object, the number of kilograms the object is made of. 
the more mass, the more inertia. The harder it is to change the object's motion. If it's at rest, it wants to stay at rest. If it's moving, it wants to keep moving. Basically, the law of inertia tells us that an object at rest will stay at rest unless a net force acts on it. Or, an object moving with constant velocity will continue moving with a constant velocity unless a force acts on it. Okay. <clears throat> so net force is required to change an object's motion. So basically, law of inertia. If an object is not moving in a straight line with a constant velocity, then there's a net force acting on it. That's what the law of inertia is telling us. If it's not moving in a straight line with a constant velocity, there is a net force. If it is moving in a straight line with a constant velocity, then there is no net force. Now, that doesn't mean there's no force at all. For example, my calculator right now, it's at rest. It's not moving. It's not going to move until I do something to it. There is no net force on my calculator right now. Does that mean there's no forces at all on my calculator right now? No. Gravity is acting on my calculator. We can't get rid of gravity. Even for the space shuttle. Even the space shuttle in orbit, they are affected by gravity. They appear to be weightless because the space shuttle and the people are falling towards the Earth at the same rate. Their apparent weight is zero, but they still have a force of gravity acting on them. That's actually quite significant. So there are individual forces, for example, acting on my calculator, but when I add them up, I get an answer of zero. So the net force is zero. That's what we're getting at here. The net force will cause the object's motion to change. Which actually, conveniently, the second law is the equation for the net force. The net force, the sum of all the forces acting on your object, you have to add all of them up. If you add up all the forces acting on the object, you get the net force. That is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration of the object. <coughs> if the net force is zero, then the acceleration will have to be zero as well. And we know zero acceleration means velocity cannot change. So whatever it's doing is going to keep doing it. A positive net force will result in a positive acceleration. This is the net acceleration of your object. Overall, how much it will accelerate. Okay. Mass, by the way, is in kilograms. Acceleration, we know, is in meters per second squared. The units of force are kilograms, meters over second squared, which we call a newton. So we abbreviate it as a capital N for the forces. Newton's third law is for the interaction. If we call the force of my calculator pushing on the table an action, there has to be an equal and opposite reaction. What that means is however hard the calculator pushes on the floor on the table, the table pushes back with the same amount of force. If the calculator pushes down with two newtons, the table pushes up with two newtons. So for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. Right now, I'm pushing down on the floor. The floor is pushing up on me with the exact same amount of force. You are all sitting on the chairs. However hard you're sit pushing down on the chair is how hard the chair is pushing back up on you. Now that may seem a little counterintuitive. If there's always an equal action and reaction, then how do we ever get a net force that is not zero? This equation right here is looking at one object at a time. The net force on a single object determines that object's acceleration. Turns out the action-reaction pairs 
always occur on the two separate objects. Okay? So even though I push on the calculator and the calculator pushes back on me by the same amount, I can cause the calculator to accelerate because the net force on the calculator alone is zero, is not zero. I'm pushing harder than friction. And so my force being bigger than friction causes the calculator to accelerate. Does that sort of make sense? The action-reaction pairs are always on two different objects. The easy way to look at it, if I push on the floor is an action, then the floor pushes on me is the reaction. The same two objects are always involved. You just interchange their location in the sentence. If the table pushes up, On my calculator, what's the reaction? Calculator pushes down on the table. Notice, the force of gravity is not the reaction to the table. The force of gravity is the earth pulling on my calculator. The earth pulled on my calculator. If I remove the table, the calculator will continue falling until it runs into something else. That's because of the force of gravity. The force of gravity pulls on the calculator. The reaction, what's the reaction to the earth pulling on the calculator? Yes, the calculator pulls on the earth. If the earth pulls on me, I pull on the earth. So why, if say I jumped off the table, I would accelerate towards the floor, why don't I see the floor accelerating up towards me? The mass of the earth is so more, much greater than the mass of Exactly. Same force, terribly different masses. The incredibly large mass of the Earth gives an incredibly small, non-noticeable acceleration. That's why we don't see the Earth flying up towards us. Our masses are small enough that the acceleration is more significant and obvious. Common misconception. So standing here, what forces are acting on me? Just on me. Force of gravity and the normal force. Normal force, remember, is the surface, so in this case the floor, pushing up on the object. The normal force and the force of gravity, in this case right now, what's my acceleration? Zero. Zero. If I have no acceleration, then I have no net force. So the force, normal force, in this instance, has to equal the force of gravity acting on me. Otherwise, I would accelerate. If one of them was bigger than the other, I would have an acceleration. I'm not accelerating. Therefore, they have to be equal. But they are not action-reaction pairs. They happen to be the same value in opposite directions, but they're not action-reaction pairs. Because they're both acting on me. They're acting on the same object. Action-reaction pairs have to occur on different objects. So the action to a force of gravity is the earth pulling on me. So what's the reaction to the force of gravity? Me pulling on the earth. The action of the normal force is the floor pushing up on me. So what's the reaction? Pushing me pushing down on the floor. Exactly right. So we don't, I'm not drawing in the reaction forces here. I'm only drawing in the actions, the ones that are acting on me. 
because it's only the ones acting on me that determine my acceleration. Got it up. So only the forces acting on the object that you're interested in determines the actual acceleration of the object that you're looking at. <coughs> All right. So we're going to use these concepts to solve problems involving forces. If we know the force is acting on an object, we can certainly find from the force the acceleration of the object. Or we could work backwards. If we know the acceleration on an object of an object, we can work backwards and find the forces acting on the object. Okay? Now, let me give you some basic equations. <coughs> Some of our force equations have set, some of our forces have set equations. Force of gravity, for example. The force of gravity, how hard the earth pulls on the person, depends upon the mass of the person and the acceleration of gravity. So little g is simply our 9.8 meters per second squared. I'm not going to put the negative sign on the g. I'm going to put the negative sign in when I solve the problem and write my vectors, my forces as vectors. So whatever you see g, little g in our equations, always use a positive value. Force of friction. Friction is an interaction between two surfaces, the surfaces sliding on each other, for example. There are three different types of friction. There's static friction. Static meaning stationary. So for example, if I lift the table up, they're not sliding down the table, so they are experiencing static friction. Static friction is keeping them from sliding down the table. Now granted, if I go high enough, we will overcome static friction and they will all slide down the table. And I don't want it all on the floor, so I'm not going to do that. So one type of friction is static friction. That's when the object does not slide. Rolling friction. Rolling friction is kind of like static, but hopefully it's fairly obvious. It's something rolling on something else. So for example, the tires of your car rolling on the ground. If there was no friction between your tires and the ground, you wouldn't go anywhere your tires would just spin and you would stay in place, which you may have experienced in the winter at some point. If you can't get any grip on the ground, that friction, if it's not there, you can't go anywhere without it. So you need the rolling friction. The third type of friction is kinetic friction. Kina, we've heard that prefix before. Kinematic equations, those were our equations of motion. Kinetic friction is sliding. Friction due to one object sliding on another. So, for example, the calculator sliding on the table. There's kinetic friction acting on the calculator during that time. The nice thing is, there's one equation that fits all three of those frictions. The equation looks like this. Mu, Greek letter, represents what we call the coefficient of friction. It is unitless. It has no units associated with it. It is a number. It is generally between 0 and 1. The only example I know of where it exceeds 1 is in race cars. When they start spinning the wheels and the wheels actually start melting because they get so hot that it actually starts melting to the road. That's the only time I know of where this coefficient of friction exceeds the value of 1. Keep that in mind. As you solve problems, if you're looking for this value and you get something bigger than 1, you got a problem. Unless it's a race car. Exactly. The other piece of information that determines the friction force is the normal force. So you have to have a surface. How hard the surface is pushing up on the object helps determine how much friction is exerted on the object. 
Okay, so the bigger the normal force, the more friction you will have. Okay. Which should make sense. If you think about it, if you've ever moved and you've packed your boxes up, some of the boxes end up really light, some of them end up really heavy. If you try to push them out of the way, push them across the room, the light boxes are really easy to push out of the way. The heavy boxes you have to push harder on. It's the same coefficient of friction between the box and the floor, but the normal force is very different. And so a heavier box is harder to push out of the way than a lighter box. Yes? Question on the coefficient of friction. Is that derived from, say, a slope that's a 45 degree slope that's one to one? one or is it, where does that come from, that unit? It actually is completely dependent on the materials themselves. So it depends upon, for example, I have rubber versus right. the table. What, what I mean is, is that drive, say, you put that on a slope, if it slides on a, I mean, you understand what I'm coming from? Yes, you can that. calculate it experimentally on a slope, but there's no, it doesn't it's correspond to a specific, specific angle. Friction friction. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, Let's see some other equations that have set drag. Now drag technically doesn't have a one equation fits all. Our book gives us an approximated value of drag for an equation which we'll use. By the way, is drag a contact force or a field force? Contact. Contact. It's contact between the air molecules and the object. Force of drag. Now, this is just an approximated equation. This isn't the actual real value if you were to do this really in real life. But it gives us a good approximation. Oops, oh, sorry, not me. Your drag is going to depend upon the cross sectional area, so the area of the object moving into the air. And V being how fast your object is moving. So the speed. So this is abbreviated. This is an approximation only. But it's okay. We can use it to approximate drag in situations. Is that uh, an approximation at sea level? Or is it like an average? Of I would imagine it's probably at sea level. I'm not positive though. <laughs> Another uh, force that has a set equation is a spring. So if a spring is at, uh, attached to your object. K is called the spring constant. Or it's also sometimes called the force constant. It's a measure of how strong the spring is. The bigger the value of K, the stronger the spring happens to be. The units of the spring constant are newtons over meters, which is also the same thing as a kilogram over second squared. X in this equation is how far the spring has been stretched or compressed. So for example, this scale, this hanging scale I have, you can't see it, but there's actually a spring in here. Right now it's not stretched or compressed at all, so it's not exerting a force on anything. But if I take that scale and It's not stretched, I put the spring on and it stretches it. That spring is connected to the dial on the front, so before the dial is not moved. I hook up the mass and the dial moves. So the dial is measuring how much that spring stretches by. Okay. The force of the spring gets bigger and bigger the more and more you stretch the spring. 
If you've ever played with a spring, you've probably noticed that before. The more and more you try to stretch it out, the harder and harder it gets. Okay. Uh, normal force does not have a set equation. It depends upon the problem itself. Force of tension doesn't have a set equation. It depends on the problem itself. Um, a push and a pull doesn't have a set equation. It depends upon the problem itself. So many of the forces we have are going to depend on the problems that we're looking at. So. Let's do some problems. Yes? What does the x represent? x is how far the spring has been stretched or compressed. 